record. Okay, we need to record this. Um, I'm also going to mute everybody while, I, while I'm here. So you will be allowed to unmute yourselves um, when question time begins, but for the meantime, we are going to stay muted. And Bob, you can please unmute yourself and Marianne too, just because you two are essential. Okay, Bob, you there? I'm here, yes. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just gonna start over. There are some, just some of these technical things that honestly, I'm still trying to get used to. Uh, so yes, I'm Hillary, president of the Art Society. Um, and as I said, you've got your view in the top right. You've got your taskbar on the bottom where if you wanna write some chat questions, you'll see chat. Um, and if you need to unmute yourself, then that's, that's there for you when question time occurs toward the end. So please just at this point, make sure that you are muted because we do hear every little whisper um, and every little dog barking. So that is greatly appreciated. Um, let's see. We are going to now switch gears and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Madison Art Society. So we are an art society of about 250 members with artist members, mainly from uh, the shoreline towns and towns around Connecticut, Madison, Connecticut and, and beyond into other parts of Connecticut as well. So please check out um, the Madison Art Society website, madisonartsocietyct.org. Um, Consider becoming a member for $25. And I think we may have Marge. Is Marge Casey here today? Marge is a past president and she was president before I was and Marge was instrumental in getting our website in having that built and bringing us into the world of technology, the modern world. So it's a very beautiful website. It's easy to use. And that was a, a wonderful step forward initiated by Marge. So thank you. So also, let's see, on the website, you'll see um, dedicated, um, a page dedicated to the members' websites. Maybe you can schedule a visit and go see some people's um, galleries. If they have studios at home, you can schedule a visit with them for maybe a change of scenery. And right now on the website, we have our members show up with beautiful works of art to view and for sale. And there will be a button there where you can vote for the People's Choice Award. So please go do that. And that artist will win $100. We also have the Creations While in Quarantine Gallery, which is on display. We've been doing that for the past year. And if you become a member of the Art Society and you are an artist or you're just even beginning, then hey, join and you can, you can put a piece of art up on the Madison Art Society website. And there is a button which is there inquire to purchase. So you just may sell a piece from our website. So please um, think about doing that. Definitely check out that website. And also with those two shows, the, the quarantine gallery and the member show right now, we want to thank Bev Shermeyer, another past president for many, many years. Bev posts to our uh, Facebook site. So she's wonderful with that. So she'll post paintings from the shows. And then Jan Thompson is our webmaster extraordinaire. She, you know, she handles the entire website, uh, gets us, just helps us with everything technology related. And she posts to Instagram for us. So if anybody has an Instagram, maybe even chat your Instagram address down there in the chat right now. And we can, artists can follow each other because that's always a very fun thing to do. Plus Madison Art Society, you know, has their Instagram. So please follow us on that and we'll probably follow you back. Um, all right, so let me tell you about some things that are happening as well, some future events. We're looking forward to the August um, juried show at the newly renovated Scranton Library. We are hoping that the show will be live and in person, fingers crossed. We, we, just, we just don't know with the pandemic, of course. So I'm sure we all look forward to an online, or rather an in-person show where we can have a reception, mingle a little bit with other people, Enjoy some seltzer or some wine and some cheese while we're viewing the art in person. Let's hope that can happen. Uh, if it can't happen, then we will have our juried show online again. So we will keep you up to date on that. And um, 
So again, we've been presenting these Zoom lectures, these art the art demos and the lectures, which Marianne has done a terrific job. Marianne Dietz, thank you, Marianne, for being so organized. And Mar Marianne reaches reaches out to the artists and the the lectures um, to present to us to keep all of us connected within the art society as well as even the public is invited to these oh, events. Get on with it. Thank you so much to Marianne for that. Also, thanks to Jennifer Corcoran. She does our press releases. So if you see things published in the newspaper, that's Jennifer Corcoran doing a phenomenal job. And then we've got, um, again, Jen Thompson, Bev Schirmeyer, who, who do the social media um, posts to Instagram, to Facebook. And Jen Thompson, of course, does the website. Also, just the entire board of this art society, it, it's, it's just incredible. I can't even go on about how amazing all of the members are, all of the, the board members of this art society. We've got, I can't even name them all. They're just, they're so amazing. That just keeps this running very smoothly. Everybody does a really great job. So thank goodness, because, you know, during the pandemic, things could have gotten quiet, maybe fallen apart a little bit. So we're going strong and it's because of all of the, the 14 board members who are so just really giving of their time, capable, everybody brings a different talent and skill. So I fully appreciate that. It makes my position easier. And then we've got the two uh, co-VPs, um, Gene O'Brien and Cher um, Sorensen who are just wonderful. Everybody is great. So I appreciate every one of them. And I want every, all of you to know that these happen because of that board. So now, just mark your calendars, if you could, please. So we're going to have part three and part four of Bob's lecture series. One will be Tuesday, April 13th. Uh, that will be American Impressionists in the Gilded Age. And then May, so both of these, the second Tuesday of each month, May 11th, will be America Boomer Bust. Bob will tell us a little bit about his entire series oh, moment. Oh on June 2nd, uh, please mute yourself. Thank you. On June 2nd, we have... Um, an art demo which will focus on plein air painting by Zufar Bikbov, who is a very recognized artist. So that is not to be missed, June 2nd. It will be on Zoom at this point. And then on, um, in October, we will have a Paul Batch present uh, an oil presentation, an oil demo, I believe. So more information about that. So now we're gonna turn to the art lecture this morning which will be presented, of course, by Bob Potter. He's been with us a couple of times now to enlighten us, to entertain us um, while we are mainly at home during this pandemic. So he will uh, keep us busy for the next hour or so. Let me tell you a little bit about Bob. Bob Potter is a graduate of Syracuse University School of Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, he spent his early career as an art director at Scholastic Magazines, Time Warner and National Geographic. Over the past decade, he helped create an arts therapy program for Save the Children, was a corporate development officer for the National Gallery of Art. He headed marketing for Mystic Seaport and he's a docent at the Yale Center for British Arts. He and his wife, Jean, who's a master watercolorist and teacher, live in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, so please remember, keep your microphones on mute. Everybody please check that now. Questions will be answered mainly at the end when Bob is done presenting. And you are invited to use your raise hand feature and the chat feature to share a question. So about the lecture this morning, this, the lecture series is titled The Art of America, How Great American Artists Reveal a New Country and Its People. The people and landscapes of America from the mid 18th century to the early 20th century have been some of the most compelling subjects for artists to study, paint, and photograph. In timeless images, the artist captured a new country as it evolved through some of the most transformative and turbulent years and eras. Part two of this series is titled A Nation Divided, A Nation Restored, as this, and it deals with the Civil War. As the Civil War tears apart this new country, photographer Matthew Brady will show to an American public the face of war, and artists Winslow Homer will portray a post-war nation of new hope. Eastman Johnson captures the African-American experience from slavery to freedom. And Thomas Aikens will paint images of America building a new future as it struggles to define its identity. Then as I said, part three and part four, one each month. 
Bob, we're going to hand it over to you now. I think I've spoken enough. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Hillary. And thanks, Mary Ann. And hopefully you all can see me. And uh, we'll jump right in. Let me share a screen here. And presentation. It's always a good thing. And <clears throat> looking. There we go. And let's see if we can just do something here and get down to one person up there on the screen. How's that? All right. Hopefully we should be there. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay. Um, just uh, Hillary, are we? How many thumbnails are we seeing down the side of the screen? A whole row, or just just me? It. I only see you. It completely depends on what each viewer how oh. they want to view what's happening. So if people don't know how to do this, please go to the upper of your image. Go to the upper left, and you'll see a, v a variety of dots and little tiles. So if you choose. The single, well, the second from the left, then you'll only see Bob's face and it's a small image of Bob. If you, that, that way it'll eliminate all of the faces that are now participating on this Zoom. So Perfect. that's the best mate. All right, thanks Hillary and, and, and welcome back. Those of you who joined us last month when we were looking at the art of colonial America and the art of the new nation moving west. So we saw so many great works by artists like John Singleton Copley and Gilbert Stewart, Benjamin West. And then uh, as the country moved west uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, we saw artists like George Catlin and George Caleb Bingham, and of course, Frederick Remington. Today, we're going to look at a nation divided, a nation restored. And we're going to begin uh, in the Civil War and then uh, move to Reconstruction. Um, we'd have to begin, if we're talking about the Civil War, with Matthew Brady. He and his team of photographers photographed the carnage of Civil War battlefields and no person would ever look at war the same way <clears throat> again. Matthew Brady would say, no one will ever know what these photographs cost me. Some of them almost cost me my life. At the outbreak of the war, his successful portrait business on hold, and at enormous personal expense, hired and outfitted a staff of around 20 photographers, including Alexander Gardner and Timothy O'Sullivan, who would take most of the war photographs after Bull Run, while Brady managed much of the operation. And there was nothing about being a war photographer in the Civil War that was easy. First, you're traveling in horse-drawn wagons that were portable dark rooms. Photographers carried extremely hazardous chemicals and hundreds of glass plates over uneven roads and rocky terrain. Preparing each glass plate for a photograph was a chemistry project. First, coating the glass with collodion, a syrupy liquid, then dipping it in a bath of silver nitrate to make the plate light sensitive. And then, while still damp, placing the plate in the large format camera, which was heavy and cumbersome to lug out into the field. And then you got to take the photograph. Then there was another lengthy chemical process back in the wagon or in a special tent to develop the plate and voila, create a printed photograph. The photographer had to work fast though. The entire process from coding to developing to printing had to be done in no more than 10 to 15 minutes before the plate dried. And if all that wasn't hard enough, 
war photographers were often exposed to enemy sharpshooters. This photo captures the faces of the common soldier, the Army of the Potomac waiting in trenches before launching their attack at Fredericksburg in May of 1863. More than 1,000 Union soldiers would be killed in this battle. It was also not uncommon for soldiers to bring their wives and children along on campaigns, all camping together. Brady photographed the generals, Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee. Union General Ambrose Burnside, the namesake for those awesome sideburns, and of course, William Tecumseh Sherman, who would destroy Atlanta and everything else in his path <laughs> on his march through the South to the sea. But it was the photographs of the Civil War dead that were something new and horrible there. These were not the grand historic paintings of men at war which glorified sacrifice as we saw last month in Benjamin West's The Death of General Wolfe in the French and Indian War. These photographs were not a tableau of a fallen general in a Christ-like gathering lamentation of mourners. With photography, the public saw the true face of war. The Union and Confederate dead at Antietam in September of 1862, where more than 46,000 soldiers died in this three-day battle. In this photo of the aftermath of Antietam, we see a little white building in the background the Dunker Church. We can still see the damage in its roof and walls from cannonballs. I visited the Antietam battlefield a few summers ago with my brother and our two sons. And the Dunker Church still stands today. In addition to his Civil War photographs, Brady would be best known for photographing the great figures of his time especially Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said about this form of portrait by Brady that it helped to get him elected president. It was taken on February 27th, 1860, after his landmark speech at the Cooper Union in New York City. At that time, Lincoln was not yet the Republican nominee for the presidency as the convention was three months away in May. Some historians have argued that this speech was responsible for his victory in the presidential election later that year. In the speech, Lincoln didn't condemn the existing institution of slavery in the South, but affirmed that he did not wish slavery to be expanded into the Western territories, claiming that the founding fathers would agree with his position on this. Before the Civil War, he was Samuel Morse, who was a painter and most famously the inventor of the telegraph, the internet of its day. Within a few years, Brady had his own studio in New York on Fifth Avenue and 10th Street. This photo was taken in 1844. In the foreground, note the top hatted carriage drivers and over in the upper left, you can just see the building sign for Brady's portrait gallery. In 1849, New York studio, Brady opened a photography business and gallery in Washington, DC, in a building which still stands today on Pennsylvania Avenue, just a few blocks west of the Capitol. From the upper windows of the building, Brady photographed a grand parade marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, celebrating the end of the Civil War. Only weeks before, mourners had watched Lincoln's funeral cortege 
pass by. Brady's studio was also a gallery that showcased photographs of some of the most famous people of the day, offering the general public a close-up look at these celebrities. Clara Barton, a Civil War nurse who founded the Red Cross. Thomas Edison, displaying his tinfoil phonograph. and authors, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Walt Whitman. And Charles Dickens and a younger Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. They would enchant their readers with boyhood heroes from David Copperfield to Huckleberry Finn. Matthew Brady's studio would produce around five to six portraits a day. A neck clamp might be used to keep the subject from moving for the duration of the long exposure, resulting in oftentimes stiff, serious poses with subjects almost never smiling. It's hard to hold a natural smile for the duration of what could be from 15 to 30 seconds of an exposure. George Armstrong Custer understood the power of publicity and the role photography could play in burnishing his ego, which was considerable, and his celebrity. Brady's series of Custer portraits in 1865 conveyed the young, brash, and overly confident hero from the Civil War who would assume the fateful command of the 7th Cavalry at Little Bighorn in Montana in 1876. And Brady would photograph famous women of the times like Mary Todd Lincoln. History has been unkind to Mary Todd Lincoln. She was a brilliant woman whose education and personality captivated Lincoln, especially her love of politics and political debate. Some of the earliest photos they could their marriage in 1842. Mary Todd, the Southern Belle from Lexington, Kentucky, and the raw boned country lawyer Abraham Lincoln from Springfield, Illinois. Her love of expensive dresses and her Southern relatives made her an easy target of Washington gossip in the press. Buying expensive designer dresses if you're the first lady. Hmm. She would never mentally recover from her husband's violent death and sadly her mental decline began long before that horrific event with the loss of their three sons. Edward at the age of four from tuberculosis Willie at the age of 12, while well, they were in the White House, and Tad at 18. Only Robert would live to adulthood and he would commit his mother to a mental asylum outside of Chicago in the years after Lincoln's assassination. Rose Greenhow, who was called the Wild Rose, was a spy for the Confederacy. She's seen her posing with her daughter inside the old Capitol prison in Washington. She used her social ties in Washington to gather and pass information to the South. In July of 1861, she sent Union plans of the Battle of Bull Run to the Confederacy before she was arrested by Alan Pinkerton. And along with her young daughter held for nearly a year in prison. She was released deported to Richmond, Virginia, and welcomed heartily by Southerners. And she would serve as a diplomat for the Confederacy, traveling to Europe. In October of 1864, while sailing home aboard a blockade runner 
pursued by a Union ship near North Carolina, her ship ran aground and Greenhow drowned during escape attempt when her rowboat capsized. Brady's assistant, Alexander Gardner, would photograph Lewis Powell, one of the conspirators in Lincoln's assassination. Seen here, Lewis Powell in a sweater, seated and manacled in the Washington Navy Yard in April of 1865. He and three other conspirators would be hung for their crime, including Mary Surratt, at whose boarding house the conspirators met and plotted. Photographs of Lincoln with his pronounced cheekbones, thick black hair, penetrating gaze, remain constant in all of his photographs. But what we see changing so dramatically is the stress, both physical and psychological, that the presidency, challenges and traumas of his family and the war would take on the president while in the White House, Lincoln mourned the death of his son, Willie, who was only 12, and the slow mental decline of his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. The last photograph of Lincoln was taken on February 5th, 1865 by Brady's assistant, Alexander Gardner. Five days later, Lincoln would be shot at Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. It's hard not to think of Lincoln's fatal head wound when looking at his last photograph and the jagged line from the accidentally broken glass of the collodion glass plate negative from which the print was made. As popular as Brady's photographs of famous people would be, his war photography would ruin him. He had invested $100,000 in his Civil War photography business, buying supplies on credit to create 10,000 plates. He was confident that the government would buy his photographs after the war. The government showed no interest. The public lost interest in war photographs and the financial panic of 1873 forced him to sell his New York studio and declare bankruptcy. Depressed by his financial situation and loss of eyesight and devastated by the death of his wife in 1887, he died pennilessly and alone in the charity ward of Presbyterian Hospital in New York City on January 15, 1896, from complications following a streetcar accident. Now let's move from photography to painting. Eastman Johnson would have an enormous impact on American art during the second half of the 19th century, not only as an artist, but one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was born in Maine, studied art in Europe, and he was inspired by the paintings of the old masters. He would be called the American Rembrandt. And again, just check if you've muted yourself, hearing just a little bit of audio noise in the background down the lower left corner, just hit that mute button. East Johnson would be widely known and admired for his genre paintings of scenes from everyday farm life. Like this painting, Corn Husky, painted in 1860. Or this painting called The Conversation at Cranberry Harvest in 1879. The subject of cranberry pickers would inspire many of his paintings, giving us a romantic impression of the hard work of people picking cranberries. But he bathes the scene in warm sunlight and soothing shadows.
Johnson's painting entitled Winnowing Grain creates a marvelous painterly effect of cascading grains of wheat infused by light, flowing like a waterfall of real gold. Wheat was literally a harvest of gold in the booming post-Civil War years. The seemingly endless bounty of America, vast land, and amber waves of grain. That's symbolized in this painting. His painting, The Girl I Left Behind, was done in 1872 during Reconstruction. It strikes a far different note one of wistful melancholy and hope. The title comes from an old Irish song popular with Union and Confederate soldiers in the Civil War. A young woman stands on a precipice. We can see she wears a wedding ring. <laughs> Her hair and dress are windblown. Her left heel holds down her blowing cape. She looks out towards a dawning light, a new day. But is the new day for her? For the return of a husband? Or for a nation that still cannot see through the clouds what the future holds? During the Civil War, Johnson followed the Union Army, sketching subjects for genre paintings, the most famous of which is the wounded drummer boy. His inspiration was an incident that occurred during the Battle of Antietam in which an injured drummer boy asked a comrade to carry him so that he could continue drumming his unit forward. The emblematic image of a heroic youth literally rising above the chaos of the battlefield resonated deeply with Northern audiences both during and after the Civil War. But many art historians would agree that Eastman Johnson's paintings of enslaved people during this period are some of the, the most important and lasting of his works. The Young Sweep painted in 1863, depicts an enslaved girl bathed in Rembrandt light and shadow. The look on her face seems pensive. Is she ill at ease taking a forbidden break from her daily chores? Or is she listening for her master's possibly threatening footsteps and what that could mean? The Lord It Is My Shepherd was painted also in 1863, and it shows the viewer what would appear to be a solemn moment in a young black man's life, reading the Bible, an activity that a white pious audience could appreciate and relate to. But this is a painting about emancipation. Johnson celebrates the common humanity of this subject but in doing so, he breaks all of the social codes of the period. The man is reading, a forbidden act among slaves, but he is a freed man. By the Union soldier's coat we see draped on the right. He has his finger on the Bible passage, the Lord is my shepherd. A Ride for Liberty, The Fugitive Slaves, was painted in 1862. It shows a black family riding for their lives in the midst of the Civil War as they gallop across a wide battlefield. You can just see the glimmer of the soldiers' shiny bayonets and clouds of gun smoke in the left horizon. The actual number of slaves escaping north in the mid-1800s is unknown. 
Author James McPherson states in his Civil War history battle cry of freedom that several hundred slaves escaped per year throughout the mid 1800s. The National Park Service says that between 1820 and 1860, the most frequent calculation is that around 1,000 slaves per year actually escaped to the north. Thomas Akins was born in 1844 in Philadelphia. And he's widely acknowledged to be one of the most important artists in American art history. He would become a controversial director and teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Akins had studied art in Paris, Romy in the Louvre, looking at the old masters. He also visited Spain and was particularly taken by the paintings of Velasquez. But Thomas Aikens was an American artist and he would remind his fellow artists, quote, of course, it is well to go abroad and see the works of the old masters, but Americans must strike out for themselves and only by doing this will we create a great and distinctly American art. As a young child, he was in this charming photograph at the age of six, holding a rolling wood hoop, the predecessor of the hula hoop. As he got older, he loved to row. Some of his most enduring paintings show us rowers on the Schuylkill River, as in this painting of Max Schmidt in a single skull, painted in 1871. The painting is one of the American masterpieces at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, there you go, that's a good view. His paintings of rowers were the first works he showed the public upon his return to Europe. Aikens even placed himself in the painting in the background, in the skull behind Schmidt. And if we look closely, we can see he painted his own name, Aikens, on the boat shell. Both his subject and his technique drew attention. It's surprising today, but in 1871, his selection of a contemporary sport like rowing came as a shock to the artistic conventionalities of the city of Philadelphia. But men rowing was nothing compared to the reaction he would receive from his monumental painting of a gory medical operation. The Gross Clinic, painted in 1875, was shocking in subject matter and execution. It depicted Dr. Samuel Gross performing an operation and surgical lecture for a gallery of medical students at the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. One Philadelphia reviewer would state, quote, we know of nothing greater that has ever been executed in America. But when the painting was exhibited in New York, the New York Daily Tribune acknowledged and damned its powerful image, writing, quote, but the more one praises it, the more one must condemn its admission to a gallery where men and women of weak nerves must be compelled to look at it. This critic's reaction was probably the same as the woman on the left, shielding her eyes with her clutching hands. My great grandfather, Dr. Thompson Eldridge Potter, was a medical student 
at the Jefferson Medical College at the time of this painting. He became a general surgeon, as were his son and grandson, my father. And I'm sure my great grandfather would have been in attendance and witnessed a surgical lecture like this by Dr. Gross while he was a medical student at Jefferson Medical College. Aiken's lifelong interest in the male figure, nude or nearly so, took several thematic forms. The rowing paintings of the early 1870s constitute the first series of his figure studies. This painting of the wrestlers in 1899 could be seen as an homage to Greek classical sculpture and the idealization of young athletes. Yet the entwined bodies and sharp angles of bone and flesh of the two wrestlers is hard, brutal. Notice their faces, red from exertion, contrasted with the pale skin of their contorted bodies. A study of the male nude in various classical and academic poses, what art students would observe and draw in their figure drawing classes, is the focus of one of Aiken's most famous and almost considered to be his most controversial painting, The Swimming Hole, done in 1884. Aikens would extensively use photography to help him develop this painting. The photograph was taken at Mill Creek near Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And with this and other photographs, he creates detailed visual references for his painting, The Swimming Hole. Here's a rough sketch for The Swimming Hole, and I think these are fascinating to look at whenever we get to see a rough sketch before the final painting of an artist, because I think it gives us a peek over the shoulder of the artist as he thinks with paintbrush and canvas about what the painting will be in composition, form, and color. Aikens wants to associate the youths with the classical Greek ideals of physical beauty, strength, and camaraderie. He poses them in a dynamic arrangement in and out of the water, representing them as types rather than individuals. All of the young men are shown either in profile or from behind, further obscuring their individual characters to concentrate on physical form and gesture. If you look closely, it appears Aikens is the reclining man on the rocks on the left and also the swimming man in the lower right, where we just see his head and shoulders above the water. The topic of Aiken's sexuality and its impact on the art that he created has been a subject of intense scholarly debate. In Victorian era Philadelphia, being gay was believed by many to be immoral. Aiken's intense study of the male form for the wrestlers and the swimming hole fueled the gossip of the day about his sexuality and would become a minefield of controversy that would eventually explode around the artist. More shocking than his paintings were Aiken's prolific use of photography, especially photos of nude men in the studio, such as these done in the 1880s, even on the right, including himself posing with a female model. Aikens argued they were meant to provide accurate anatomical references, but raised many eyebrows, especially in the academic community. He was finally forced to resign in 1886 from the Philadelphia Academy 
for removing the loincloth of a male model in a class where female students were present. Akins was married and his wife, Susan Hannah McDowell, seen here in a portrait by Akins from the mid 1880s. She was a painter and a photographer, sometimes his model, and she was his fiercest supporter through his struggles with the Academy. After Aiken's death in 1916, she would resume her own painting, but not receive the recognition she deserved until her work was included in a 1976 exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art, entitled 19th Century Women Artists. During his lifetime, Thomas Aiken struggled to make a living from his work and experienced profound disappointment when he was dismissed as the director and teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which he had transformed into the leading art school in America. This would be a professional and emotional blow that he would never fully recover from. Akins died on June 25th, 1916 at the age of 72. In November 1917, the Metropolitan Museum of Art opened a memorial exhibition of 60 of his paintings. The Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, a month later, would put on an exhibition of 139 of his works. And by the early 1930s, Akins was considered one of America's greatest artists. The reputation he enjoys today and a favored son of Philadelphia. Winslow Homer was born in Boston in 1836 and was largely self-taught. He began his artistic career in the late 1850s as a freelance illustrator for popular magazines such as Harper's Weekly. I think we recall from last month's lecture, that's where Frederick Remington got his start too, as an illustrator. Winslow, Homer's subjects range in a virtuosity of technique, storytelling. Through Winslow, Homer, we saw almost everything that would define American life in the late 19th century. And as much admired as he was, this is what he would say about his work as an artist. Quote, talent, there's no such thing as talent. What they call talent is nothing but the capacity for doing continuous hard work in the right way. Through the paintings of Winslow Homer, he would work masterfully in oil and watercolor, painting scenes of the Civil War. The innocence of rural children at play. A woman of fashion reclining with a book. A game of croquet in Newport. and hunting in the Adirondacks. His paintings of life on the water from his lush and vivid sunset watercolors of the Caribbean to the shoreline seascapes of Maine would also distinguish him as one of our greatest American marine artists. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Harper's Weekly sent Winslow Homer to the front lines where he sketched battle scenes and camp life. In this painting of a Union camp scene entitled Home Sweet Home, he presents two tired soldiers outside their tent watching a pot boil on a campfire. Far across the river, in the upper left on the horizon, there's another encampment 
but of Confederate soldiers with their campfire smoke drifting above the camp. It was a common practice when Union and Confederate soldiers camped across the river from one another. Common practice was to take turns playing their own favorite music, creating cheers from both sides, and then the bands would play Home Sweet Home in unison. After one such musical interlude like this, a Confederate soldier wrote in his diary, quote, I do believe that had we not had the river between us, that the two armies would have gone together and settled the war right there and then. This painting of a Union sharpshooter on picket duty is considered one of the most memorable of Winslow Homer's Civil War paintings. We see a lone soldier perched and balanced on a tree limb with his rifle steadied in deadly aim. Now, contrast this painting sharpshooter with this painting. The veteran in a new field, painted soon after Robert E. Lee's surrender on April 9th, 1865, and President Abraham Lincoln's assassination five days later. It's one of my favorite Winslow Homer paintings. In it, he depicts a soldier returning to his farm after the Civil War. He's revealed to be a Union veteran by his discarded jacket and canteen at the lower right. His old fashioned scythe evokes the Grim Reaper in a field of wheat, recalling the war's harvest and lives lost. In this painting, Homer offers a powerful meditation on all the soldiers' sacrifices and the potential for America's recovery after the Civil War. In the years after the Civil War, children, as embodiments of innocence and the promise of America's future, a popular subject for artists. Snap the Whip, painted in 1872, is one of Homer's most beloved works and evokes nostalgia for the loss of innocence in the Civil War. And as the vision is shifting to cities and the little red schoolhouse faded from memory. In this painting, we see the school children released from their lessons. The exuberant barefooted boys engage in a spirited game of snap the whip, which required teamwork, strength, and calculation. All important skills for a reu reuniting country. Following an extended trip to Europe in 1866 through 1867, Homer adopted a warmer palette, a looser brush technique, and an interest in painting outdoor scenes that owed much to the influence of contemporary French Impressionists, such as Manet and Monet. Homer's paintings of women share the same quiet beauty of the French Impressionists. They depict everyday women, painted with bold, fresh brush strokes, light and shadow, and a sense of the moment captured. Winslow, Homer's mastery of watercolor, never more evident than in this stunning painting of a young woman in a long orangey red dress reading a book. In 1877, he exhibited this watercolor entitled The New Novel at an exhibition of the American Watercolor Society. It's a deeply intimate portrait and Homer seems to be almost spying 
on the woman, enjoying the scene as a voyeur, enraptured by the young girl's complete lack of self-consciousness. What is the novel she is reading that has her so captivated? Embracing a book as she might a lover. She is not engaged in productive activity at all, what it might be thought of at that time for women to be doing rather than just reading. She is consumed with an inner life that leaves her unavailable to any responsibilities that might be imposed on her by family or potential suitors. She's present, but not really here. She's gone into a world unavailable to those closest to her, that of her imagination. Considered by many at the time, especially men, as a dangerous place for a woman to be in the 1870s. Opening a woman's mind to imagination was tantamount to opening Pandora's box. Moore's skill as a figurative artist is only surpassed by his maritime paintings. In 1883, moved to Prout's Neck, Maine, and lived at the family state modeled carriage house 75 feet from the ocean. Homer wrote to his New York art dealer about creating this painting saying it was painted 15 minutes after sunset, not one minute before, as up to that minute the clouds over the sun would have their edges lighted with a brilliant glow of color. But now the sun has got behind and beyond their immediate range, and they're in shadow. You can see that it took many careful hours of observation, he said, to get this right, with a high sea and the tide, getting it all just right. One of Homer's most beloved paintings is Breezing Up, painted in 1876. It could be the nautical companion piece to the boys on land playing Snap the Whip. He would work on this painting for over three years. The painting's message is positive. Despite the choppy waves, the boaters look relaxed. The anchor in the bow was understood to symbolize hope. The boy holding the tiller looks forward to the horizon, a statement of optimism about his future and that of the young United States still recovering from its civil war. Today, Breezing Up is considered one of the most iconic of American paintings and among Homer's finest. The National Gallery of Art purchased the work in 1943 and heralds it as, quote, one of the best known and most beloved artistic images of life in 19th century America. In contrast, here, there is nothing but a sense of calm. Boys in a boat, rowing across gentle waters that are aglow in color with distant sails silhouetted against billowy clouds of orange. Winslow Homer was trained as an illustrator for Harper's Weekly, and I think at the heart of all his paintings, he's a storyteller. Here, a lone fisherman at sea is in strong contrast to the optimism of Homer's paintings of boys out for an idyllic day of sailing on the water. The Fog Warning is a painting with a foreboding narrative. Its tale is disturbing rather than charming. As indicated by the halibut in his dory, the fisherman has been successful, but the hardest task of the day is ahead of him, rowing back to the main ship that we barely see on the horizon on the right. 
He turns to look at the horizon, measuring the distance to the mother's ship and to safety. The seas are choppy and the dory rocks high on the waves, making it clear the journey home will be challenging and demand all of his remaining strength, especially after a hard day of fishing. But more threatening is the approaching fog bank we see on the horizon and the danger of losing sight of the vessel. The dramatic tension of the fog warning is all the greater because Homer does not specify the fisherman's wake. In the wake of the ocean waves, what will be his fate? His frail boat rides like a shell upon the surface of the sea as the fog increases. Will the fog blind his vision, cutting off all marks to guide his course and leave him lost at sea? Can he find his way back by hearing the captain's bell? Homer found inspiration in summer trips to the Northwoods Club near the hamlet of Minerva, New York, in the Adirondacks. It was on these fishing vacations that he experimented with the watercolor medium, producing works of the utmost vigor and subtlety, hymns to solitude, nature, and to outdoor life. His watercolors of fishing are among his most accomplished paintings, and exemplify both the subtle and bold power that a watercolor master can create. The color effects are boldly applied. Every brush stroke is confidently made. In terms of quality and invention, Homer's achievements as a watercolorist are nearly unparalleled. I can only think of Sargent's watercolors of Venice as their equal. Now I know the theme of the art lecture today is American visions of uniquely American subjects, but in closing, I can't leave Winslow Homer without sharing some of the paintings he created on his trip south from Maine to the tropics. There's some of his most exquisite watercolors. Beginning in 1884, Homer made many winter visits to tropical locations and watercolor became his preferred medium while traveling. He painted scenes in Key West, Florida, the Bahamas, and Bermuda, where he painted this landscape of bright light and saturated colors. Homer's mature watercolors are suggestive and experimental, immediate responses to visual experience. Although these works may look effortless, they were carefully planned. What is intentional is his mastery of putting paint on paper, every stroke decisive. Yet the result never seems labored. It's fresh, immediate and magnificent. About his watercolors, Homer would write, quote, you will see in the future, I will live by my watercolors. His prediction was accurate as watercolors provided him with a handsome income. They were admired by the public and critics alike, and their influence on artists of succeeding generations has been profound. My wife, Jean, who is a master watercolor painter, would certainly agree. But Homer would not paint just lush tropical landscapes. He would paint scenes of native life, like the turtle pond. But he would also explore life and death in the tropics what is considered one of his most significant paintings, the Gulf Stream, which he painted in 1899 on his return from the Bahamas to his studio at Prout's Neck, Maine. Homer was obsessed with this theme of men 
in small boats surrounded by large sharks. And also the idea of a derelict sinking boat with swirling sharks, as in this painting done in 1885. He would take all of these ideas Combine, he would combine them, he would move them back to his studio, he would continue to work as he developed the fog warning, but also these subjects in the tropics, riveting scenes of danger and human desperation. There's a photo of Homer in his studio where we see him hard at work developing this theme. Now, Homer was, of course, influenced by John Singleton Copley's painting of Watson and the Shark, which we saw in our first lecture last month. It was a painting done 100 years earlier, and it depicted the rescue of the English boy, Brooke Watson, from a shark attack in Havana Harbor, Cuba. In the Gulf Stream, the situation seems hopeless for it. The sailor sprawled on his shattered boat the mast is gone. What remains of the torn sail could be a funeral shroud. In the distant horizon on the left, you can barely make out white sails of a ship that we can assume is oblivious to the situation and any rescue. An ominous funnel cloud is seen in the distance on the right. Was it the storm that destroyed his boat or another storm that will finish the job? In one slow Homer's painting, Snap the Whip, we see the students released from their lessons. And with this painting, I will release you from today's lecture on the art of America. But before we go, just a reminder that next month we'll meet the American Impressionists and revel in the Gilded Age, along with artists like Child Sam, William Merritt Chase, and others. So I look forward to Zooming with you again. And now we have time for some questions and comments. You can please use your raise hand feature or you can maybe even put your hand up. We may not see you physically put your hand up though. So I would use the raise hand feature, please. And let's see, Marianne, maybe you can scope around and see who needs to be um, unmuted or people can unmute themselves. Any questions? I'm sure we have many. Anybody? I have a question. <laughs> Bob, you hear me? Yes, Bob? I do. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I thought that that was interesting about the Union Major General Ambrose Burnside. Burnside. Who on earth came up with that and switched the last name? to come up with the, you know, the facial hair <laughs> that we all know and love from what, the 60s, I don't know, 70s, I don't even know when those were most popular in our, in recent time. <laughs> well, certainly sideburns were very popular as was copious amounts of facial hair as we look back uh, on the uh, photographs from uh, the uh, mid uh, 19th century. Hang on a second and I'll see if I, I can just take you back there for a minute so we all can luxuriate in those uh, great sideburns. There we go. Uh, there we go. Just so we know, you know, he wasn't the only one with those. There you go. Yes, indeed. Uh, That's so interesting. There he is. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> General Ambrose Burnside. Uh, I know less about him. I think we all know more about uh, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman 
uh, who uh, had fiery red hair <laughs> and a red beard. I saw a wonderful painting, a uh, portrait of him at the uh, Union League Club down in, in New York uh, City. So yeah, that's where uh, uh, so I always enjoyed taking a look there. But again, it's a kind of remarkable if we think about the wonderful, uh, <laughs> Just about everyone had a beard. And, uh, and now during COVID, I think uh, so many men have grown their beards. So uh, who knows? That's I true. We've seen uh, perhaps more, more men with beards uh, in, in, uh, this week. That's, yes, COVID. that's been going on actually for a few years now with young men, um, with, I don't know, the millennials maybe, um, Gen Z. I have a son who's 21 who can't really grow a very good beard, but I think November, what is it? Is it no shave November? They have all these things and, and you know, just so many young men today have the beards and it's it's very, the, the facial hair. So it's it's very different from- Another uh, sorry, I, I see here eight chats. Uh, and okay, uh, good. What we're seeing there, uh, nice comments. In, okay, good. Uh, in what part of the country did Eastman Johnson do most of his paintings? Good question. And uh, hang for just a second, and let me pull up Eastman Johnson, if I could. Let's see if I can do that for you. So we know. Uh, by the way, Eastman Johnson was a new artist for me, and uh, that's one of the things that's fun about putting these uh, programs together. I really did not know Eastman Johnson. Uh, and um, he's painting uh, in New England. He's in New York. He's a founder of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, he's uh, on the East Coast. He's down in Washington painting. He's followed soldiers around the battlefield. He's seen scenes of rural life genre paintings. We're up in Rhode Island with the uh, cranberry pickers. And uh, his paintings are showing us, and again, we can't escape the influence of European, particularly Impressionists, this idea of capturing the moment, painting light, very free brush strokes. Um, this is a such a marvelous, marvelous uh, painting of this stream of cascading gold, golden wheat flakes. But also paintings that at the time um, resonated because it's probably hard for us to imagine, you know, in Reconstruction and post-Civil War America and the devastation the apocalypse of the Civil War. Uh, and this painting so much captured this, some might think somewhat sentimental or melancholy, but not at the time. The loss of life, the idea, um, would the uh, a man come home from war? Is there a future? Uh, the people left behind. And for veterans, the memories of Civil War. But I think it's his African-American paintings. These are the ones that, again, I didn't know about Eastman Johnson. And these are the paintings I think are in some ways as important and certainly today the most important because he's painting them during the time of slavery. He's painting subjects that uh, are not the subject paintings. And he's painting subjects that are intimate, respectful. Uh, they have humanity that all viewers uh, can relate to. Um, there's, by the way, uh, part of these lectures, spend some time and if you've written down notes, go online, go to uh, YouTube and uh, input Eastman Johnson. There's a wonderful lecture uh, on this painting, The Lord is My Shepherd. There's also a wonderful uh, lecture uh, on uh, the uh, Life for Liberty. Take advantage of those, particularly when they are museum lectures, because when museums have retrospectives, 
and major exhibitions on artists. They'll oftentimes do really superb professionally created videos. And uh, in a lot of my lectures, I include these. I'm just a little nervous technology wise, sometimes on Zoom, but I do that in live lectures. But take advantage of those. There is a fabulous Winslow Homer uh, from CBS Sunday Morning uh, out at, at his Prout's Neck studio. So any uh, of these artists uh, do take advantage of those. Uh, you'll see quite a bit of their work and really wonderful commentary. But I think the Winslow Homer is just as they do on CBS Sunday morning, as they do so many wonderful shorts, uh, videos uh, on artists. So do take advantage of those. Um, I think the other, again, takeaway from today um, is again, starting with the Civil War uh, is a natural point. We left off last month out west uh, during, again, overlapping periods. We saw Frederick Remington doing paintings during the Civil War. We see this kind of mid-century and late uh, 19th century in his paintings. So to resume uh, the series with the photography, we now have a medium that is showing us the people of the period. A medium that in terms of the popularity of Brady's photographs uh, takes off as fast as television took off in the 1950s. Everybody wanted a photograph and itinerant photographers were roaming the country taking photographs. But I think Brady's photography of the war in particular, and then from there, the aftermath of the war and seeing Reconstruction and seeing what artists like Winslow Homer and Eastman Johnson, uh, what subjects they're painting. Uh, the appetite for war, understandably, was, was not great. Uh, the idea of renewal, the idea of, of survival, the idea of hope, the idea of the future coming out of the cataclysm of the Civil War. Uh, certainly in the South, it would take years. Uh, you know, because of the physical devastation of the South, uh, Sherman's march to Georgia. Uh, but also I think Thomas Aikens, he gives us an idea of Philadelphia and an idea of an artist grounded in uh, the old masters in Europe, but dedicated to creating American art. But also an artist so dedicated to this classical ideal of the human form and particularly the male human form, and using photography to inform that as accurately, as anatomically as he could, and the price he would pay in the Victorian Society of Philadelphia. So again, we kind of think about these artists and we think about the challenges they faced and the impact they made and the advancement of art and stopping for a few minutes just to look at their work and in the kind of context of what lies uh, ahead. And next month, we'll pick it back up as we uh, enter the latter part of the 19th century and the Gilded Age and uh, see artists that we're familiar with uh, and the impact they will have, particularly American Impressionism of which we know quite a bit about that, that here in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which was the home of the American Impressionists at the Florence Griswold boarding house. So I look forward to seeing you all next month. Let's see, I think there's another, and uh, let's see if I can bring that up. There's another chat, let me scroll down. I'm not as facile on chat as I am with chatting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There are a lot of compliments on chat to you, Bob. Good. Good. I see someone saying they're going to check out YouTube. Uh, thanks, Bob. We live near the National Gallery in D.C. This talk was a chance to visit great paintings. Well, I had the great good fortune of working there for a few years. I see that in person. Um, let's see, um, anything else there? And um, 
Well, good. It looks like from these comments, people enjoyed it. I hope everyone did enjoy it. We covered a lot of art. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you back uh, next month. And uh, any other questions you have, the email address that Marianne, when she sent out uh, the wonderful announcements and links. So send her a note. I know she'll forward them uh, to me. But again, I hope these lectures kind of encourage to go and dig deeper on any one of these artists of which we could have spent the entire time looking at their work and quite honestly, probably should. <laughs> But uh, yes. it's fun to, fun to look at a lot of work. So thanks for joining us. And, and Bob, thank you so much, as always, for presenting such an enlightening program to us. Um, and just imagine if you learned something about <laughs> some of these artists while you were preparing this. Imagine how much we've learned. Eastman Johnson and all of these various artists that you've um, brought us through in this period of time in our history. It's a period that we don't spend a lot of time hearing about, you hear more about World War II, the more recent things in history in our country. So this is good to bring us back and remind us of our beginnings. So thank you so much, Bob, again. Well, you're welcome. And, it's, and one thing that it was funny, I think I mentioned to, to Hillary and Marianne, let's see if I can bring that back up, yeah. That in some previous lectures, people had said, well, now, Bob, you, you, you don't include personal anecdotes. And, which I chuckle a little bit at because I haven't personally met these artists. Uh, so we don't have <laughs> little, little anecdotes and takeaways. But in thinking about that I, uh, and looking at dates and, and looking at artists, it was one of the nice uh, little uh, discoveries of including my great grandfather who was a student there at the time of uh, the Gross Clinic painting. So it made me think, yes, he's, in that crowd of young medical students somewhere, observing he would be, he was there uh, at the time studying medicine. And uh, so I, uh, I think anytime we can make kind of those connections. And for me, that was a way to think uh, more personally about this painting and uh, kind of the family history of doctors. He, my grandfather, my father, I went to art school. So, um, but a nice connection between medicine and art. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone, and uh, we'll see you next month. All right, everybody tune in, tune in next time, please. Mary Ann will be sending you information. So please tune back in and hear part three. Okay, everybody, have a great day. Thank you again, everybody. Bye-bye.